until a few months ago, as the senator from Arizona pointed out, no one had any idea that the Citizen United case could potentially become the vehicle for such a wholesale uprooting of the principles that have governed the financing of our elections for so long. The case started out as a simple challenge to the application of Title II of the law that Senator McCain and I sponsored, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002. The issue was whether the provisions of BICRA relating to so-called issue ads could constitutionally be applied to a full-length feature film about then-presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. The movie was to be distributed solely as video on demand. Yet somehow at the end of this term, last term, instead of deciding the case on the basis of the briefs and arguments submitted by the parties early this year, the court reached out and asked for supplemental briefing on whether it should overturn its decisions in McConnell versus FEC, the case that upheld Bicker in 2003, and Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce, a 1991 decision that upheld a state statute prohibiting corporate funding of campaign ads expressly advocating the election or defeat of a candidate. So that set the stage for the recent a special session to hear re-argument in the case. And now we await the court's verdict on whether these long-standing laws will be in jeopardy. I certainly hope that the court steps back from the brink. A decision to overturn the Austin decision would open the door to corporate spending on elections the likes of which this nation truly has never seen. Our elections would become like NASCAR races, underwritten by companies. Only in this case, the corporate underwriters wouldn't just be seeking publicity, they'd be seeking laws and policies that the candidates have the power to provide. Chief Justice John Roberts, who many believe to be the swing justice in this case, made grand promises of what he called judicial modesty when he came before the Senate Judiciary Committee in 2005. Respect for precedent was a key component of the approach that he asked us to believe that he possessed. Here's what he said, quote, I do think that it is a jolt to the legal system when you overrule a precedent. Precedent plays an important role in promoting stability and even handedness. It is not enough, and the court has emphasized this on several occasions, it is not enough that you may think the prior decision was wrongly decided. That really doesn't answer the question, it just poses the question. And you do look at these other factors, like settled expectations, like the legitimacy of the court, like whether a particular precedent is workable or not, like whether a, uh, whether a precedent has been eroded by subsequent developments. All of those factors go into the determination of whether to revisit a precedent under the principles of stare decisis, so said then Judge Roberts. Mr. President, talk about a jolt to our legal system. It's hard to imagine a bigger jolt than to strike down laws in over 20 states and a federal law that's been the cornerstone of the nation's campaign finance system for 100 years. The fundamental principle of our democracy is that the people elect their representatives. Each citizen gets just one vote. Our system of financing campaigns with private money obviously gives people of means more influence than average voters, but Congress over the years has sought to provide some reasonable limits and preserve the importance of individual citizens' votes. One of the most important and long-standing limits is that only individuals can contribute to candidates or spend money in support of or against candidates. Corporations and unions are prohibited from doing so except through PACs, political action committees which themselves raise money only from individuals. The Supreme Court may very well be about to change this forever. Now, does the Supreme Court really believe that the First Amendment requires the American people to accept a system where banks and investment firms, having just taken our country into its worst economic collapse since the Great Depression, can spend millions upon millions of dollars of ads directly advocating the defeat of those candidates who didn't vote to bail them out, we want to prevent future economic disaster by imposing some strict new financial services regulations. Mr. President, I say that because that's where we're headed. Is the court really going to say that oil companies that oppose action on global warming are constitutionally entitled to spend their profits to elect candidates who oppose legislation to address that problem? 
Now, the average winning Senate candidate in 2008 spent $8.5 million. The average winner in the House spent a little under $1.4 million. A single major corporation could spend three or four times those amounts without causing even a smudge on its balance sheet, Mr. President. This is not about the self-interest of legislators who will undoubtedly fear the economic might that might be brought against them if they vote the wrong way. This is about the people they represent who live in a democracy and who deserve a political system where their views and their interests are not completely drowned out by corporate spending. Some will say that corporate interests already have too much power and that members of Congress listen to the wishes of corporations instead of their constituents. I won't defend the current system, but I will say, imagine how much worse things would be in a system where every decision by a member of Congress that contradicts the wishes of a corporation could unleash a tsunami of negative advertising in the next election. In light of the immense wealth that a corporation can bring to bear on such a project, I frankly wonder how our democracy would function under such a system. We are talking about a political system where corporate wealth rules in a way that we have simply never seen in our history. So once